Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Paris for our very short introductions uh, series. It's naturally very difficult to provide with a satisfactory overview for such a powerfully majestic uh, center of uh, medieval civilization. Uh, think about the monarchic mystique, the, the sacrality of, of some places that made up the, say, the, the mystique of not just a kingdom, but an empire, right? This is, uh, in my opinion, I made multiple videos about this, the specific nature of the French realm, right? As it started being compacted, there is naturally a debate, a profitable debate at some point, we could make a video specifically on this, but I already addressed the matter, um, a bit in all the, the ones addressing uh, the the Merovingians, the Carolingians, the Carpathians, um, etc. Because, of course, um, in the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century, we grew a bit paranoid um, towards the concept of actual continuity um, in uh, in identity, in cultural legacy, in some, even in the specific polit uh, political and institutional systems, but I think it can hardly be denied that even if Paris, as we'll see now, was not specifically the center, of course, of um, what in fact did not exist as the Royaume de France uh, yet, but the, say, the nature of the monarchy that eventually decided to reside uh, in this city uh, and making her essentially the one of the greatest capitals um, in the world if not the greatest capital in the world, it's it's difficult, right? There is a there is a saying it goes like uh, only uh, Paris is worth of Rome, and only Rome is worth of Paris, right? And um, there is definitely a universal nature that rivaled with and even surpassed the same uh, Germanic Empire. Um, and uh, again, it, it's really right. I can't digress for this video about the topic, but for all those who ask me, uh, what about the the role of nations in, in tradition, right, given that you're often against uh, nationalism in a, at least in the 19th century, with, which is what specifically has, it's essentially a nationalistic, socialistic, fort estate, anti-traditional ideology, and the French Revolution is actually one of the best examples of this. But definitely there is a national, not a nationalistic element that, um, in the case of the Franks, was notoriously, just for the Jews and, and the Romans, a divinely chosen people, a divinely chosen role, right? And this is the reason why at the beginning of, of the 14th century, Philip IV of France was um, quarreling with Pope Boniface VIII because they both literally called themselves Caesars and emperors, right, of, of Christendom. And this is not anecdotal. It's actually one of the single most... Uh, important historiographical themes of, of late medieval Europe, but not all. So, Renovat's Imperi aside, that we will, however, refer to, I think it's important to give a minimal uh, introduction uh, also of the ancient background of, of Paris, right? Uh, you know, the early uh, Celtic settlement, uh, the location which uh, is debated. Some say that it was. Uh, on the same Ile de la Cité, others says that it was uh, for south of uh, Nanterre. In any case, the Romans constructed the new city called uh, Lutetia, or Lutetia Parisiorum, so the Lutetia of the Parisi tribe, um, that had been defeated by the Romans, but, you know, keeping uh, to, to dwell uh, in, uh, during imperial times. In fact, the Romans... Uh, structured the center to serve as a base for um, the Roman legionaries as well as for the Gallic auxiliaries, and it was named after the, uh, the at least the etymology is debated, admittedly, uh, but some say it comes from the Latin word luta, uh, so they used to say something like mud or swamp, because especially the uh, the northern um, the the rive droite, right on the, uh, say the right bank, in fact, of, of the Seine, was the, the marshiest. Uh, in fact, the Romans, at least, uh, and probably also the earlier Celts, had established their their bases uh, you know, on the on the left bank, which in fact this the city uh, developed. Um, so. 
Paris at the time was led out along a north-south axis following the traditional Roman town design. The main Roman street on the left bank followed uh, the Rue uh, Saint-Jacques, uh, crossing the Seine and the Ile de la Cité via Pont Notre-Dame. Uh, we will see in part this, this references the, the locations, what existed also before the, the more famous um, medieval um, buildings still standing today um, on the Ile de la Cité and in, in other parts of the city. Now, the port of Paris was on the island uh, where the uh, Parvis of Notre Dame is today. For example, the city was located on the Montagne Saint Genevieve with a forum, a temple, a basilica, a portico. The first century, the uh, amphitheater was built nearby, sitting 10 to 15,000 spectators despite, uh, despite a small population. The Tarn de Cluny, famous baths built near the forum, received fresh water from an aqueduct 16 kilometers long. Uh, promoting romanization um, and growth during the 2nd and 3rd centuries. Lutetia, a medium-sized Roman city, imported Roman cuisine, including Italian wine, olive oil, shellfish, and garum sauce. Despite its commercial importance, it was, however, smaller than Lugdunum or Agendicum, the capital of uh, Lugdunensis Quarta. In the 3rd century AD, Christianity was introduced to Paris by uh, Saint-Denis, uh, the bishop of the Parisi, um, Kivitas, right? Uh, now, Saint-Denis is um, the heart of, uh, of a spirit that uh, is incarnated at the fullest by Frat. We will see now the development of the saint's cult, uh, the, the foundation of, of, of the abbey, the, the, the visceral connection that existed with the, uh, with the Merovingian monarchy and the, the other dynasties following um, the same control of this uh, imperial power. And the most important thing is that if you do not conceptualize that France is Saint-Denis, but, um, and that especially, and this is the most important point, that there is no such thing outside of Saint-Denis. In France, right? France is Saint-Denis and nothing else, right? And if you do not understand this concept, do not only you cannot be called a French, but you cannot be called a Westerner, right? The, the mere significance that the, the foundation had and the essentially the, the, the basilatic connection that existed from this relatively modest center at the beginning to the single most powerful polity in Europe, you cannot understand any traditional sense of, 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 of world history uh, in its entirety, right? The entire concept of, 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 of transcendental uh, purpose and admission of the French uh, Empire, the, what, what was founded with Clovis, and made multiple videos about this topic, but remember that this is the centrality of it. France is exclusively Saint-Denis. It doesn't exist anything that is called France outside of Saint-Denis. And there is no such a thing like being French or a Westerner without knowing this exclusive fact. Right. Saint-Denis was beheaded on Mount Mercury and carried to a secret Christian cemetery. Um, Mount Mercury is basically Montmartre, is the in fact, the, the place where the martyrs were, were killed by the Roman authorities were essentially in the mid-3rd um, uh, century. Um, and there are legions discussing why you know, the abbey was traditionally built wh where, where it was. One says that the, the beheaded martyr essentially picked up his head and walked up to um, the place uh, where he would be buried uh, anyway. It was in fact, it was believed to have been buried. In fact, there is a cemetery just in the, like in in the, behind the church that is also the first Gothic building, right? Fully Gothic building existing, by the way, historically. Um, the other is that a faithful um, Christian woman known as Catula uh, uh, came at night in the place where the uh, the, the saint had been martyred and uh, she um, brought uh, his corpse to the 
to the location of the app. So very, very quickly, by the 4th century, Paris had her first bishop, Victorinus, uh, and as such a cathedral, right, would be the one of Saint-Étienne, uh, historically. In the 3rd century uh, AD, the Germanic tribes, um, you know, attacked Paris, leading to the displacement of the left bank residents to the Ile de la Cité, that was more easily uh, defensible, um, through the bridges, right? The left bank's monuments were thus uh, abandoned, and the island was transformed into the first city wall of Paris, just, just per se. The city was later known as Parisius in Latin and Paris, Paris, uh, in French. From 355, to 360 Paris was ruled by Julian, right, the nephew of Constantine the Great, and Caesar. Julian spent winters in the city, writing and establishing his reputation as a philosopher. In 360, he proclaimed himself Augustus, making de facto Paris, at least from a, from a formal point of view, the, the administrative capital of the Western Roman Empire for, for a while. Two other emperors also spent winter in Paris attempting to halt barbarian invasions. Uh, the Roman Empire's decline led to the decline of the same Paris. In 451 AD, Attila the Hun threatened Paris, but at this point, the geographic episodes of saint Genevieve uh, persuading the Parisians um, to resist uh, were are particularly f- famous. Um, the, the, on that occasion, uh, saint Genevieve, uh, you know, was meant to, to have averted, in fact, the same Hannek march uh, on the city. In fact, the, the army took another route um, before being defeated, by the way, at the Catalanian plains. Uh, in 461, the Salian Franks um, uh, attacked Paris, and on that occasion, Genevieve, together with the um, the Bishop of Paris, Germain, organi- organized the defense and saved the city by bringing wheat um, in uh, during the siege from Brie and Champagne. As such, Saint Genevieve became the patron saint of Paris. The Franks, a uh, Germanic tribe, moved to northern Gaul, uh, at this point quite you know, influenced by Rome, but uh, still pagan, right? Worshipping uh, Odin, uh, Thor, I mean, the, the entire package of the Germano Norse um, religion, let's say, was still, like, you know, in a autoistic sense, oriented towards even Christianization and just the general sense of, of, of the also traditional religion as based on a single god, the, the, the rest of the data is being just an hypothesis of the same. Now, um, Frankish laws became, at this point, the basis of uh, what would be French law um, uh, in the future, at least the, uh, the one of the uh, langue de l'île. Um, Latin was replaced by uh, French uh, over, over time, gradually, uh, leading to the Franks becoming uh, politically uh, like ingrained uh, in the area, uh, building a large army on the same basis of the Gallo-Roman uh, systems, uh, and so on. Now, we don't have to make the, the, the broader history of, of Clovis and the Merovingians, because we focus on the city, and there is really a lot to say. In any case, Clovis I, who became ruler in 481, uh, at 16, conquered Gaul and entered Paris, where he pledged to convert to Catholicism. Um, and having won the Battle of Tilbiac and converting himself to Christianity, was baptized in Rheim in 496. It would be, in fact, as you know, the, the usual location of the, the crown of the, of the French kings, uh, not Paris. Um, uh, Clovis... Uh, drove the Visigoths out of Gaul, right, um, chose to be interred in Paris himself, so giving for the first time to this city a um, a royal um, uh, prestige of some sort. This was far from making the city um, 
uh, like the capital of, 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 of the realm, but it was already at this time the typical Merovingian mentality, a joint property and fixed symbol of the dynasty, as all the, the important Roman um, cities. Um, so, looking a bit more at uh, medieval era, per se, it, we cannot separate such um, Merovingian uh, connection with the, the foundation still of, a, of, a, of, of the monarchic mystique um, that Paris, in part, um, embodied, especially because of the host of religious edifices that Clovis and his successors built there. For example, a basilica on the uh, Montagne Saint Genevieve, um, essentially, this is a, on a hill overlooking the left bank of, of the Seine, um, near the site of the ancient forum. The cathedral of Saint Etienne that um, stood where Notre Dame stands today, uh, and several important monasteries, including one in the fields of the left bank that later. Uh, became the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. It's important to notice that the Ile de la Cité not just was um, by now the center of Paris, uh, as we observed um, different from ancient times, but that essentially the spiritual area was um, being established on the eastern part, so upstream, um, of the island, while lay power, the residences of, of the kings, etc., where the, the Louvre would have been built, as we'll see um, much later times, were downstream on the western end, and they had already the, the profile more of a fortress, right? Because, um, as we'll see, up to significantly late in time, these this buildings were properly conceived to defend the city from from invasions that, as we will see now, would uh, would occur, right? So again, this Paris is not the center of um, of Neustria, of this uh, regional, like essentially of the Seine basin, um, ju just per se. But you understand that just because of the location on the river, this was uh, the the center was growing, right? The the Franks had essentially some. Uh, count, large country mansions. Um, they had uh, some other logistical point de pu, including these cities, as a matter of fact, also Ram, Compiègne, and so on. Um, but they didn't quite have a center. The court was itinerant, notoriously, and this would uh, go on for, for, consistently, uh, for a consistent amount of time. It's not before essentially the 12th century that you can't start talking about a real continuity. Um, uh, of the uh, court uh, royal residence in, in Paris. Built the Basilica of Saint-Denis, there had already been a, a shrine um, in previous times, other, like this would take the form of an abbey, right? But the most important thing we were saying before is that the Merovingians are the ones who start fundamentally to get um, interred in the necropolis that thus became the royal one of the kings of France, notoriously. Now, the, the barbaric um, elements of the revolution, as you know, made uh, you know, ir irreparable damage um, uh, in, uh, say in much later times, but enough to destroy a great part of what uh, was left there. And uh, if you visit the basilica, it's, uh, I must say, I mean, to me, it was personally a, a, a mystical experience. Um, I didn't have Stendhal syndrome, of which I actually suffer from different, di di different uh, historical places, such as at the Capuzina, okay, okay, I, I broke down in tears, which, you know, I don't, I don't cry even when people doubt things like that, so there <laughs> must be something there. Um, but it's one, like, I, I think once in your life you should go there in the first place. And there actually are still not the, uh, not just the Gisan, not just the, 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 the monumental tombs. They're just by themselves are very beautiful. Um, and for not talking about the architecture, I mean, this is the, the very first Gothic church that we can admire. 
and there is all Sujar's history. Now we will talk about uh, the entire Dionysian uh, theory, as a matter of fact. But there are actual um, uh, earthly remains of, of much of the various kings, including uh, Louis the Fourteenth. I mean, all all of the great, um, all the, the all the great French monarchs, and it, it's one of the single most moving uh, and um, solemn uh, signs that you can imagine. So the the concept, as we were hinting at before, is that literally the um, the kings of France uh, became considered that notoriously the, the basilica is far beyond the center, right? So this was located in, in another place, outside, right? In, in a dimension that, um, let's say, uh, goes beyond the same Paris um, per se, and in fact uh, takes on an imperial relevance. And here, these powerful dynasts that um, coming from century from Germany, having served as Roman generals, having um, founded a, a power based on their Frankish rule of, of an, an alliance uh, with the very powerful Gallo-Roman nobility. And, and I've seen, uh, I described this in a bit about the sacralization of the Merovingian monarchy. It was very, um, very am emetophiliac. These people were fanatically obsessed, to say the least, with blood, with their um, genetic continuity, right? So the, the choosing this place, this this place as a necropolis, um, had a, a mystical meaning. It had to go, of course, uh, beyond, beyond, beyond that. It had to be about uh, resurrection, about regeneration. The entire medieval art and, and beyond, like one of the Ancien Regime here, I posted pictures of angels, of this of course, not just in, in Gothic, you realize that the, the push towards the sky is basically the, what the entire uh, rule of uh, France uh, got down to. And this is what, in fact, uh, the 19th century ideologists wanted absolutely to make you, to, to cancel, because they didn't want to make the Fort Estaders feeling challenged uh, in their own personal failure. So that today they don't teach you, like... Um, you know, let's study what France actually was, or what the, the, the Gothic buildings were. Just they, they tell you about the technique, about the society behind that, and what's the daily life in in uh, of, of a medieval Parisian. They have can't have done anything possible to cancel the primarily um, imperial. This is the single most important thing: the imperial, traditional, Catholic um, ideology that ruled at that point the entire world. I mean, the, the Franks dispossessed the gods of the guidance of Europe, and you can identify it the spring of, um, of Western civilization uh, in the uh, following uh, millennium and, and, and beyond. And um, I can't digress specifically on this, but just think that this chosen race, as they technically saw themselves, all right, out of the, the blood sacrifice uh, in war and God's victory, and thus the Holy Ghost conferred to them, um, made them connected to to this to the spiritual dimension so much that they declared themselves as the most powerful rulers in Western Europe as vassals, right, as humble servants of the Abbe. Right, so that they were technically vassals of this abbey. The, the abbey was their mistress, and um, coming uh, short of that relation would have made them lose uh, the empire in the first place. Um, none of the Merovingian buildings of Paris sadly survived. Uh, we can think of some parallels right throughout Gaul or Italy or the typical 6th, 7th century uh, architecture. Um, there are just some Merovingian columns in the church of Saint-Pierre de Montmartre uh, that is definitely also one of the oldest surviving churches in Paris, second to in fact, the, uh, the, the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Uh, Saint the kings of the Merovingian dynasty were uh, had been up to that point buried 
in fact in, in this in this abbey um, it's with Dagobert the first meaningfully enough because he was also the last Merovingian king under which the kingdom was unified um, who uh, died in 639 that the first Frankish sovereign is buried at Saint-Denis. Now, the kings of the Pepinid Arnulfingian a dynasty who came to power officially in 751, um, moving the, um, the Frankish capital, by the way, uh, to Aachen, right, at least later when it was uh, refounded, styling Rome, as you know, and technically being the parallel of it north of the Alps, uh, paid relatively um, less attention to Paris. I mean, they were Austrasians. They came from the east of, of the Frankish kingdom in Germany, from there, around Cologne, right, Herstel, etc. Um, yet, um, the the importance of these Neustrian cities was crucial because the, the actual core land of, of Carolingian imperial military power came historically from there because of the massive acid, the, the floridity here. Like, there is... Uh, just an environmental notion that you have to, to see here. The sand is the sand basin is one of the the large um, uh, at, uh, Atlantic ones with, with this enormous plains, right? Uh, with with Latifundia had largely remained at least um, similar to, to the ones of Roman times that conferred to the Franks the, the capacity again of developing their de facto professional cavalry because of this immense amount of wealth concentrated in the hands of very few. Uh, the cities, however, and their bishops especially, played always this crucial role in, in the, uh, in especially supporting the monarchy as it was normal by that time, and, and very, very strong since the beginning uh, between the Franks, in fact, and the Gallo-Romans. So much so that Pepin the Short built an impressive new sanctuary at Saint-Denis. So conferring a further great prestige to Paris that was religiously guarded. Uh, this is proven also by the fact that Charlemagne consecrated the same sanctuary on February the 24th, uh, 775, uh, in person. Right. So the city uh, was one of the most prestigious in, in Gaul already, um, especially in Francia properly meant, right? Um, the, the considered that the, the northern Gallic cities were, generally speaking, uh, less developed than the ones of the, you know, of the Gallic south, right, of Romano, Visigothic, or Burgundian tradition. However, they were also rising consistently, especially from the 8th century, you know, the, there is a general economical revival. These are, again, the, this is the, the basin from which uh, the Carolingians control, right, from uh, from the Elbe to, to, to southern Italy, from the, the Mark of, of Barcelona to Pannonia. So all the elites that inhabited these places were just becoming richer and um, investing in their land, in, their, in the city and in, in, in others. Now, the Carolingian Empire um, enters, as you, as you know, a crisis in the 9th century, and Paris is significantly affected by this as the city was repeatedly attacked by the Vikings. That uh, would see, of course, in, in the sand, the highway, in fact, to, 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 the, to the basin, and Paris was the most important city that could be pillaged um, in case of, you know, of success. But it was already an impressively built city, and um, there was no way fundamentally to break through. Uh, at least they, they tried. There were there was a there were fiercest fight at some point, as you know, the the, the Frankish kings pay the the Vikings a tribute uh to go away. In any case it's it's a dramatic situation. The Norse demanded a ransom and ravaged the field. Uh in December eight hundred and fifty six um the Vikings who had been wintering on the island of Ocel attacked and burned 
uh, the the surroundings, the the outskirts, the the boroughs of of, of Paris. Um, so that that was the point because there weren't major um, like the the city wasn't just the Ile de la Cité, right? The right bank and the left bank were all inhabited, but they lacked a substantial defense um, as suburbs. So this is where the, the Vikings hit the hardest with significant damage, right? Consider, as we'll see now, that the left bank was the most populated because it was on a higher ground, was drier, um, and so just altogether a better place to live. In, in the, on the right, you had the swamps instead, but also the, only, the most advantageous uh, uh, area for, for establishing a river port that naturally was, was importantly active at this point. And, and of course, with the Ile de la Cité uh, in, in, in between joining uh, these. Now, according to the Royal Frankish Annals, the Vikings in 856 burnt all the churches, with exception of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, uh, the Cathedral of Saint-Stephen, the Church of Saint-Vincent, and Saint-Denis, right, which were spared due to a payment of ransom. This, this is what the, the Royal Frankish Annals say, uh, for 856, uh, 57. Now, the most famous seizure of Paris was, however, the 885-886 one, when the Vikings besieged the city for one year, which was dramatically unusual for the time being, but uh, the north of fort was really massive. On this occasion, they used also uh, catapults of some sort. I mean, they brought... Um, they uh, together like the the best even in terms of technical capacities. It, it's interesting to see the Vikings, of course, showing that they weren't uh, per se just uh, primitive brutes. Nevertheless, they um, they failed. Right. Um, the uh, the counts of Paris defended the. Um, uh, the the city valiantly. At this point, they were. Uh, sent this word the authorities left essentially the bishops and, and the counts right the um the imperial authority was was ineffective at a point the vikings tried again in 887 889 they failed uh, again and and this having to do with the very heavily fortified um uh, ile de la cité uh together with with the bridges that also essentially prevented, this is how the Western Franks successfully halted, telling the truth, um, at least in, in the sand basin, most uh, the, the Viking raids, uh, by building fortified bridges, right? They couldn't rise up further, because um, how do, do you dislodge, right, such a um, fortification with the means of the time? It's not easy at all. The same island was all, well, a walled, Right, um, and uh, the Western Franks definitely were not a um, let's say a, an inferior military than than, than the Norse one. But these are the, the the changes that brought the Vikings to uh, to shift their move towards towards England, for example, more preferably. Um, and so, the Parisian resistance is also a testament to uh, the, the the consolidation, the, the effect in them. Ness, even in terms in times of crisis, right, and of the decline of continental Europe, uh, essentially Carolingian, post-Carolingian um, civilization, what was to deeply unify, right, the, the continent even after the end uh, of the empire. Um, the two bridges we were talking about, by the way, uh, vital to the city were protected by two massive stone fortresses that at the time reveal also the the strategic uh, relevance that was given to these passages right from one side you have the grand chatelet uh which is funny because it's a sort of diminutive right of chateau but it's grand so it's great at the same time uh, which was standing up to the 19th century, right? Aside from various destructions, we will see now. Think about the Bastille that at some point had become a, a symbol of the ancient regime. These were all medieval fortifications that 
were torn down even for urbanistic purposes and so on but they were there right the Grand Châtelet was defending the um, the bridge that connected the Ile with the uh, Rive Droite so the actually most exposed um, uh, say the most strategic point in fact this was the largest fortification right um, and the Petit Châtelet on the Rive Gauche right uh, these had been built notably enough by the initiative of the Bishop of Paris Jochelin telling you how crucial uh, not just how powerful the say the diocese had become in, in post um, Roman Europe uh, but um, revealing their how deeply involved in the institutional um, policy right of 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 the of the Carolingian world and beyond they they would uh, they, they were growing right because uh, the counts other lay authorities kept following the pattern of, of inhabiting uh, also outside of 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 this of the cities right but those who had to say guard the the, the defenses the walls uh, organize also the, the the urban militias and so on. very often at this point during the second invasions uh, this is very evident in goal but not only were the bishops that were also militarized uh, as a consequence now the Grand Châtelet gave its name to the modern place between the first and fourth arrondissement which was exactly where the Châtelet uh, stood right um, during the uh, the 10th century um, Paris grew of in importance right the uh, Robertian branch of the Counts of Paris would consolidate um, its power in the city um, on, on the Ile de France uh, as a whole right and this is where the Capetians fundamentally descent was a uh, biological uh, continuity um, via female uh, ancestry with the same Carolingians um, and as a consequence uh, the city became one of the uh, the center of one of the most important uh, principalities in in Western Europe for this reason we will see it perhaps soon in our series about the Ottonian campaigns Paris was besieged by Emperor Otto II, right? This uh, is just one of the uh, many military episodes of the Franco-German War of 978-980. Paris was not uh, conquered by the Eastern uh, Franks, who were, by the way, chased by uh, the Westerners, uh, who even uh, managed to 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 destroy their uh, rear guard during um, during uh, river crossing. Uh, anyway, this was already a in- uh, powerful indicator where the center of Western Frankish power lay. It doesn't matter how fragmented um, the land overall was politically, but uh, the Ile de France was already emerging as at least the the center of the recognized um, uh, royal power right at the end of of the 10th century uh, the Capetians with Hugh um, in 987 came to power and this is the dynasty that basically continues um, still this point like the uh, like we we call them at some point the the Valois the the Valois Angoulême the Bourbon but these were all Capetians Right, they were just different branches of the same uh, line dynastically. Pick the name from whichever uh, fief they had uh, received. Right, just but they were all uh, descendant from 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 Hugh Ka- Capet. The Saint Capetians still spent a little time in the city in these first uh, couple of centuries. They did however restore the royal palace on the Ile de la Cité so on, on the western end because of the various wars and destructions and so on and they also built a church where the Saint-Chapelle 
um, that we will see in a while stands today, right? Um, so you, you see that also archaeologically that the continuity of of the places of uh, of worship and of of, the, of sacred um, uh, value that uh, accumulated right in, in here. Like consider that the the site of Notre Dame is thought to have been the uh, the the seat of of, uh, of of the Roman temple of Jupiter, right? The aforementioned hill. Uh, of Mercury, it was called like that because of actually the 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 the, the temple uh, to Mercury existed there. So there is a also much more than that that we can't simply and directly um, document, but that uh, had maintained a meaning for locals throughout all the centuries, right? So Paris um, began to to prosper. Uh, at this point, right, the right bank uh, especially began to be populated um, with that uh, an important uh, mercantile flotilla to to develop and to to trade, uh, but also uh, with, with of course uh, up to the the channel and beyond. Um, but the, the same continental location of the city could uh, make it. Uh, easily in contact with, with Germany, with Spain. I mean, some of the most important routes really did pass through there, and this was the seat, de facto, of, of, of royal power, at least the Ile de France, generally speaking. And so also a great part of the power that passed through to the hands of the Parisian um, rulers. Now, on the left bank, the Capetians founded an important monastery, that is, the Abbey of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, uh, this church would be rebuilt in the 11th century, um, and the monastery owed its fame uh, to its scholarship in illuminated manuscripts. Um, later on, there was a specific uh, Parisian style with very marked, well outlined, and colorful um, characteristics. Um, there was already at this point uh, a, a relevant um, uh, school uh, in Paris, um, lots of religious institutions, so a lot of, of ideas that people who had mostly to, to work with the church that in turn supported um, the monarchy that needed these prelates to just not challenge in, in a lay um, fashion the, their own prerogatives against the, the powerful lay vassals that surrounded the Ile de France. Um, so at the beginning of the 12th century, the Western Frankish uh, monarchs of the Capetian dynasty controlled, um, however, still only this province, fundamentally. Um, Paris was already the heart of it. So this is the moment in which the, the city starts behaving like, like a, a capital is chosen as such, especially from the time of Louis uh, VII that... Uh, decides to stably uh, reside there and he would be followed essentially by by his successors um, this is the reason why Paris um, starts mm, without uh, any doubt to become the political religious and cultural capital of France also demographically you know, agriculturally, the Ile de France is extremely fertile. This is uh, like the, there is a a very clay-like uh, soil, very fat uh, one. This helped finding the uh, material that would confer to Gothic architecture that specific look, right? And even just the kind of the the engineering possibilities to 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 implement the latter. In the 13th century, uh, she would reach 200,000, perhaps uh, almost 300,000 inhabitants, right? Um, basically, w with Milan, this was the largest city in Europe. We do not have a precise measure, so we don't know whether a city or the other was the largest, um, but uh, it, it is uh, incredible, right? It, it's massive, and especially for um, for the lands north of the Alp. This is the the embodiment of um, a, an unspeakable amount of power that just the French kings um, that began to call themselves such from the, th the beginning of the 13th century under the reign of Philip II Augustus, not 
just Western Frankish kingdom, but probably kingdom of France, um, can boast. Right? It's um, difficult to summarize in a few words the the, the prestige, uh, the fame, the the wealth, and the power of of this century. It's Paris is. Um, it not just grows, as we will see now, with the university on the left bank, south of the Seine, uh, like the, the most important uh, theological studium uh, in uh, in Europe, right? Uh, Paris will always maintain the the, up, the the first, the top position um, for uh, theological studies, but especially because this was the capital, the largest uh, dominion. Uh, in the continent, right? Not just the, say, the traditional northern French uh, space was basically uh, sucked into Paris, um, but uh, the south of France, uh, the the same Naples, like this worked as different um, realms, as a matter of fact. Um, but say the sense that the French and now, especially with with the thirteenth century under Louis the Ninth, etc., open literally to the um, to the Mediterranean, they had subjugated the, the Occitanians and were opening to to the invasion of Egypt, right, of, of the Holy Land, and to the actually accomplished conquest of Constantinople. Aside from say the the general fate of the Latin Empire, um, made this this power at, at, at the at the, uh, at the contemporary shrinking of the Germanic Empire the the hegemonic one uh, in Europe, right, uh, soundly allied with the papacy, this massive wealth axis that uh, included some of the, the most prosperous courts at the time, in fact, Paris, Avignon, uh, Rome, um, Naples, etc. So uh, these are the places where modern bureaucracy was developed, where massive juridical... Um, and theological, like the, the think about scholastics, right? The, the same Gothic uh, art embodying this um, explosion, this uh, skyrocketing towards towards God, the renewed confidence of mankind in the possibility of um, you know attaining salvation through divine grace, but by the the traditional Catholic endeavor of, of the works, right? So. Here the French had um, reacquired what um, the general crisis of the early Middle Ages had bribed them as far as especially the access to the Mediterranean and the possibility of pushing even uh, even beyond uh, in the picture. And this is um, clamorously um, evident under any point of view, artistically, militarily, um, statally, right? France is the single most concentrated power at this point feudalism still is the the key but you know by the end of the 13th century the necessity of keeping all this this leviathan together as we've seen also in many videos would force the um the, the french um the politics and institutions to profile themselves in a never better defined functional way and paris was essentially at the center of this mechanism because it was finally becoming a not just a capital, but but a massive one, right? London, for example, was an older and proper capital than than Paris had been, but there is no comparison in scale, of, you know, of of power and just the size, the the general um, output, right? Culturally, uh, politically, religiously, uh, and so on, right? Um, so there is a distinctive character of Paris that uh, keeps uh, emerging on, uh, at this time with her style, with her this, this levity, this sense of a, of a heavenly uh, uh, ideology permeating the entire, the entire space, right? The, again, the sense that the lords of the city are the closest ones to God are fundamentally emperors in their own regard. The Ile de la Cité was the site of the royal palace, right? uh, uh, the construction of the new cathedral of Notre Dame uh, began in 1163 on those 
as we've seen, already important uh, places of cult. The Rive Gauche was the site, as we just recalled, of the University of Paris, the Sorbonne, that was established by the church um, and the French royal court to train scholars in theology, but also mathematics and law that were to substantiate strongly against this uh, massive institutional structure that had to work with some of the finest minds at the time, very much um, you know, wired to the oligarchic nature of the system. So something that was, as we've seen, habituated just to manage um, a- an enormous amount of people, of goods, uh, of land, right? So all these people had to be dramatically skilled, not just in the just in, in the practical uh, notions of you know of mathematics, of accounting, of juridical matters, right, and negotiating this politically, but building together with this, or at least developing further from the, from tradition, the sense that this building was sacred in nature, right? So the sacrality of the same monarchy. And her um, universal mission, also of, of protection of the church, like now, as we've seen, the French were rising to to the point of dislodging um, the Swabian rulers from uh, from their feudal holdings in, in southern Italy in the name of the papacy with a crusade. Um, as we will see now, the the just the prestige of the theological studies alone would uh, would confer this uh, undiscussed primacy. To Paris, but the crusading endeavors of her um, sovereigns is also one of the most important uh, feats of this. Like the the idea that that the king has still to lead fundamentally the the, the army of the French, right? And so the flower of European um, nobility. Uh, of blood, and so this sort of race of, of, of chosen warriors that has as its primal objective to re- bring the world order together, right, by the sword, through justice and this uh, divinely enlightened leadership. Um, the, the the northern French spirit is the is very rigid, cold, um, also brutal. Telling the truth, I mean, if you compare made some videos about the Capetians, uh, the comparisons with, with Aquitaine. Uh, to a point, it's also stereotypical, but uh, aside from, again, the, uh, the the same more kind of social, uh, lower estates aspect, like the sense that the leadership, that the elite here is everything, is, it the, is at the peak of technical superiority on, on the battlefield, of moral capacity uh, uh, showed like an international competition. Uh, they have the best knights, uh, the best chivalric um, ideology. The, the the French epos uh, is also the, the elaboration of older ones. It's spread with its characters, its literature, its language everywhere, right? Uh, in Europe, it's art, right? God expresses its decline in different countries like Germany or Italy or Spain, and in 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 the in the peculiar way of those lands, but. It, it's from France that this and, and from Paris. Um, it, this is the point that all this emanates, radiates, um, uh, and gives uh, almost a Platonic sense of the effect of the Dionysian ideal that had been used to to build the same magnificent cathedrals that start popping up uh, all of a sudden, right, in these generations, 80 all over Europe, and uh, the multitude of French ones that are the most sound, the most perfect realizations. Uh, and th- these were based historically on the work of the pseudo Dionysus that had been exchanged with the Saint-Denis of the 3rd century, like the, the, the bishop uh, of, of Paris. Um, that was also confused at the same time with Dionysus the Areopagite, that um, was uh, um, an Eastern um, prelate and a scholar. So that Suger Saint Denis is not built through, say, uh, Vitruvius, but through Augustine's De Musica, that 
uh, referred um, to some numerical proportions, uh, effectively mirroring divine perfection, and the pseudo um, Dionysus um, uh, Neoplatonic uh, ideals, right, that were perfectly matching again the, the traditional, um, you know, divine idea of a world that has, say, of a man that has the purpose of reuniting the world and coming closer to God in this uh, imperial control over over the universe. Um, and uh, the, the motives, the, the sense of pure spirit, uh, that's the same Gothic walls illuminated um, by the by the, the, the lights, the, arm, the armories there chromatically, um, that have to look like light themselves, as if the walls were made of light themselves. So this is the contrast with the, again, heavenly core and the uh, figure of the Gaguya, for example, outside of the, the, uh, the, the building that instead represents the, the evil, the, the distortion, the imperfection of the world that is, however, just part of the, the, the fall, right? And so the responsibility of the individuals. And so while the world has this apparent, um, uh, looks that, like as this um, degenerated abomination, as a matter of fact, there is always a matter, uh, a way to, um, to transfigure it to bring it back to the one and to make it perfect and this is the task of the imperial french mark and there cannot be any other right so this is how the, the world is ruled um at the time um the wealth here is significant um the abbey of saint germain de prés and the abbey of saint genevieve uh, are the other two great monasteries of paris at this point that um, are um, uh, are established as, as also main uh, centers of learning. On the right bank, uh, north of the Seine, we have instead the financial uh, center, right? The one of trade, of commerce on the on the Seine, the one where the port, the central market, the workshops, and the houses of the marchands de l'eau, so the merchants of the water, that also give the the coat of arms of, of of the city of Paris traditionally with the with the ship and the waves. Um it's um it's really the beating heart right, of the say, of, of this immense this is a metropolis, right? So just think about feeding the people, um bringing the wealth in. This normally was again the case that people came to leave like to in in the suburbs uh suburbs whatever more or less as we will see now included eventually by new um walls at the protection of the same because still at this point risks of invasion are, are quite concrete as we know and we'll see better now um and that um and there are must be under somebody's management logistically in terms of supplies and so on. In fact, the, the League of the Marchands de l'Eau, that is also known as the Anse Parisienne, was established um, at this point um, with the blessing, let's say, of, of the um, of the French kings that have to care because that's the only way, as we've seen, to control the mob. Um, and uh, there are instances uh, which um, need uh, an attention, even towards the ideological terms, that these ideas, um, say, th this this communities develop, because Paris is the greatest theological uh, center in, in Europe. But because of this, new ideas come. Think about Aristotelianism, that eventually, that first is censored, then is, and condemned, then is actually integrated by scholastics, some of the greatest um, scholars of this time come to work from other countries um, in uh, in Paris. I mean, the same Saint Thomas Aquinas from Italy, Saint Bonaventura from Germany. Um, there are uh, and more right here. These are the, the times of uh, even in the previous, especially during the 12th century, rather than the 13th of Abelard et Eloise of unprejudiced thinking, of uh, luxury, of the sense that uh, Paris is also a, a place of, of a perdition, right? The, all the, 
the Dominicans and Franciscans are sent to study here, there, there is always the problem that how do you reconcile that with the life of the city? That's what these new um, uh, new communities are designed to to cope with, because the heresy was spreading exactly from from the centers and. Um, eventually orthodoxy triumphs, but also at the conferment of new privileges, of new power that is to be conferred to the rising uh, communities that once of the Marchand de Lowe had been one with this somehow radical ideas, but not just for, I- for ideological reasons or uh, theological ones, right? But because they that were conflicting jurisdictions between the prevot uh, of, of the city, the, the monarchic uh, rule, the, let's say the, the various estates that competed with one another so that the French monarchs intervened by conferring specific rights, um, specific constitution uh, to this guild that they will also co-opt in order to, to mitigate the importance of other centers. Like throughout all this there is a a French policy to a scale that of course goes far beyond the one of the city of Paris. I made a bit about the case of Soissons as a French commune uh, with Louis the Sixth that tells you basically how that the monarchs were uh, were operating in the control of the cities, right? As we've seen, the bishops had a great power, and the Ile de France and the Northeast uh, uh, had, had historically been very uh, very loyal to, to the kings, had, however, accumulated um, a shocking amount of power, right? And the, uh, the fueling of communal rights, for example, was aimed um, at this point to uh, undermine in part the uh, nobility or the, the ecclesiastical power in these cities, even though, of course, the French monarchs were some of the people who had, of course, the greatest contempt towards the lower estates because they were thought to be, again, of that um, chosen stock and the latter to be the least of that. Still, their, their task was to rule, um, and this was a very effective mean, especially when the um, the commoners were increasing in power, where many of them um, formed, in fact, the, the bulk of the um, of the same French uh, royal armies that had not just an excellent cavalry but very good infantry forces, thanks to, to the centers and the cultivated. Uh, let's say uh, Paris, especially, was a bit spoiled on her own. Um, we have seen, uh, in, even in the bit about the French army organization of the 14th and 15th century, there were all dosed amount of troops that had to be provided. But still, right, especially as a logistical center, uh, just for operating, think about during the 12th to 13th century, we made videos about this Western Frankish campaigns at a point. Um, Paris herself provided with an enormous amount, again, of supplies, of, of, of resources for the French army, and so on, that cost enormously. But these merchants invested themselves in the crown because they knew that, and uh, say, they would have been the capital of this enormous thing, right? And um, at some point, other problems arose, we will see, from uh, this same place. But the monarchy in France particularly was destined to 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 triumph anyway, not without struggle. Now at the beginning of the Middle Ages, as we were saying before, the royal residence was on the Ile de la Cité on on the uh, on the western end. Um, between eleven ninety and twelve oh two, King Philip the Second builds the massive fortress of the Louvre. Right. Um, it's massive for the time being, then eventually would be enlarged dramatically, as some of these, the pictures that I uh, uploaded here show you. Um, the Louvre uh, was um, was designed to protect the, essentially the right bank at that point against the um, English attacks from Normandy. Right, This was the, the most vulnerable part, was also the financial um, heart. Um, so it was the one that needed to be protected the most. The first Louvre um, castle was essentially a great box, right, of 72 by 78 meters, right, which for the time was massive, right? This is the age, I made a video about the cost of 12th, 13th century 
castles between France and England, right? We didn't talk, I think, about the Louvre specifically, but it fits um, this general picture, the uh, the advancement in military engineering, siege techniques, think about the Chateau Gaillard on, on the same Seine downstream. Um, that was a great worry for the Marchand de l'eau that had to pass there and being, you know, uh, really vexated uh, by by the by the Normans. Now, um, this um, uh, great rectangle of the first Louvre had uh, four towers and was surrounded by a moat. By the way, um, so it was a very complicated thing to storm because there is even the 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 the, 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 the river in between. So it, it's um, you know, logistically, like how do you seize Paris, especially? At this point, with the armies of the time, right? Gradually, armies will become ever more punching and powerful, and, and so on. But um, this point, especially, it's really a bulwark uh, in which to invest. In the center of this Louvre, there was also a circular tower, thirty meters high, and the foundations can be still see uh, today in the in the basement of the Louvre Museum. Um, before um, departing for the Third Crusade, Philip II began also the construction of new fortifications for the same city. He built a stone wall on the left bank with 30 round towers. Um, this was particularly important because up to that point there hadn't been a like a unique uh, wall of any kind to protect, especially this more demographically concentrated area that had suffered at some point certain devastating attacks. Yes, it were palisades, uh, just the, the typically complex systems of fortification, even without necessarily a, a single wall that still functioned in the Middle Ages, but this was really something. It came like as a massive infrastructure. On the right bank, uh, the wall is extended for 2.8 kilometers with 40 towers to protect uh, the new neighborhoods of the growing medieval uh, city and the, probably the trade center, as we've seen. So this was even more fortified for the aforementioned reason. Um, you want to travel uh, with safety also concerning what happens at home you know, while you go at the crusade. Right. And many pieces of this wall of Philip Augustus, I inserted some pictures, can, can be seen today. All right. In particular, uh, in the uh, Le Marais district, uh, spreading across parts of the third um, and the fourth arrondissement on the right bank, right, uh, was the largest as we've seen. Philip um, the second projects were not over though, because um, much appreciated by the Parisians, um, he uh, paved the full smelling mud streets with stone. Uh, this was very um, uh, very, very luxurious, I'd say, for, for the time, in the sense that paved um, roads it did exist, but they also were considerably costly, right? So it's just during, normally, in fact, the 13th, the 14th centuries that the biggest centers in Europe have a, properly a, um, a stone pavement. Um, and over the Seine, Philip II also rebuilds two wooded bridges in stone, the Petit Pont and the Grand Pont uh, that were also heavily fortified uh, historically now you, you see uh, essentially just the, the modern ones but are, there are beautiful uh, pictures that up to a few centuries ago really tell you how big they were just there, there are other European cities that maintain this covered bridges this even with houses with fortifications on it well, it was all like that. Imagine it like this, because you you can't quite even properly pass it, right? It you have to to fight against this again very narrow uh, uh, passage with lots of troops in inside, but it's, it's it's very complicated in the first place. Um, naturally, the the kings were concerned about the same mob, which is always uh, it's not just pervasive, but it just leaves there, so it's just going to go away, and you want to guard yourself against revolts or something like that. Philip II even builds the construction of the Les Halles, that is um, Paris' central fresh food market on the right bank 
right this was a covered market which was also quite uh, updated for the time now the reason why philip ii builds all of this stuff is that he had famously enough basically cash but the the entire almost the, the entire uh Angevin possessions in france right so effectively controlling most of it and consequently accumulating an unprecedented amount of wealth uh, that was invested largely in, in the same in the same city right because uh, the uh, the quarrels with with England too were were over, but you may never know what what could happen in the first place, and you just wanted to reinforce, especially your own royal power, um, in in front of your vassals that are very powerful, but now are gradually giving way to your um, impressive power. Another key figure, of course, is we could make the history of the various French monarchs at this point, but we don't have time, like Philip IV, a ruling between 1285 and 1314, under whom, um, say, France as a state reaches the greatest amount of power. Um, and the, this was um, a moment of substantial reinforcement of the apparatus that had been essentially built just on the wake of this massive expansion quite rapidly, and it now had to be orderly, right? Um, f uh, Philip reconstructs the royal residence on the Ile de la Cité, transforming it effectively into a palace, right? And two of the great ceremonial halls of this construction still are uh, visible within the structure of the Palais de Justice. Philip also builds a more sinister structure, which is the Jubé uh, of Montfaucon, that was essentially... Um, uh, the main gallows, right? In fact, in Gibet, um, used to essentially expose the um, the the scaffold, like the, the the dead criminals who were executed, right? This was located near today; it doesn't exist anymore, but near the modern Place du Colonel Fabien um, and the Parc de Beaux de Chaumont. Um, this was uh, a very fierce. This is the time of the trial to the Templars, to uh, substantial persecution, also confiscation of the goods of, of the Jews, of the Lombards. Um, there was a very positive uh, iron-fisted policy by Philip that trying to incarnate a sort of unchangeable, uh, perfect, divine uh, model and had a very high sense of the order of the institutional system in spite of the uh, also of, of some of the failures that occurred under his, to say the least, under his reign, but not because of his incapacity, on the contrary, because it was the, the challenge here was keeping, was, was preventing the system from falling apart for how costly it was, right? Um, so um, an increased amount of um, public authority was necessary to keep uh, all together. Uh, the uh, Knight Templar, uh, the Knights Templar had been uh, arrested uh, in 1307. Um, they um, they would uh, they had grown substantially powerful from a financial point of view, but after the abandonment abandonment of the Holy Land with the fall of Acre, about which I made a video, um, uh, they they were also uh, militarily um, weaker. Right, so the French monarch, in order to uh, absorb all the enormous amount of land that the Templars had in, in France as well as in other countries, was all done together with the papacy that issued the persecution. Also in other countries, some not really doing so, and so some Templars were fleeing there. Um, but that's so, famously enough, the, uh, the, the Grand Master of the Templar Order, Jacques de Molay, burned at the stake on March the 18th, 1314, on the western point of the Ile de la Cité, so the, the very uh, seat of uh, the royal power, right? And so uh, a very eloquent way of uh, pointing out the, uh, in many ways, the imperial affirmation, like over disorders, because generally speaking, the Holy Roman Empire had protected them as long as they were in the Holy Land, but France now, and also with the crisis that was incoming, was to nationalize, um, like other countries in this 
um, prequel to the, the contraction effect of universal and uh, powers, both the Papas in the Empire and also this massive uh, French um, realm that was effectively, as we've seen, the largest in Europe. So, um, and this brought Charles V um, between 1356 and 1383. So in a very difficult moment of the Hundred Years' War, um, his father has been captured. I made a video about the Battle of Poitiers describing that phase. Built a new wall of fortifications around Paris, right? So that an important section of this new perimeter uh, can be still seen uh, in the within the Louvre complex, thanks to some archaeological excavations led uh, at the beginning of the 90s of the 20th century under the Place du Carousel. The Bastille is built under Charles V. This was a very large, sturdy fortress guarding the Porte Saint-Antoine at the eastern end of, of Paris. At this point you had to watch your back, literally, you know, from, from the Burgundians. Um, so this was a mean of, further mean of control. Now the Bastille is, um, has become a, a symbol, again, of the the, the imposition of the ancien regime, but that was a, a broader function, you know, that the building does not exist anymore, but you can technically still see it all across Paris because the uh, stones that made up the Bassi were used um, to build some uh, some palaces uh, across, the, uh, across the city. Um, also, an imposing new fortress at Vincennes, east of the city, outside of it, um, with a chapelle, with a um, with a perimeter, with a with a with a, in fact this massive fortress with very um, tall towers, etc., is also built with the function of say of support to to the city, uh, like the, as a possible escape location or like just yet another fortress around. So just consider the say the system around Paris that here is being affirmed because. France is falling apart again uh, with with the Hundred Years' War. So now uh, the the French monarchy is ever more connected with the uh, say the Ile de France, uh, at least in a in a broader strategic sense, right? Um, and it must structure it against enemies that are somehow more um, say more punching than before including saying that the same English, the, the, the Burgundians, right, uh, etc. Um, and in this, Charles V moves also his official residence from the Ile de la Cité to the Louvre proper, right? He preferred actually to live in the Hotel Saint-Paul, was his um, beloved residence uh, that uh, was begun in 1360 by the same Charles uh, uh, V, right, on the ruins of a building that had been constructed by Louis the Ninth uh, in the 13th century. We'll naturally talk about him because of the Saint Chapelle, etc. Um, and uh, so you see all these various um, control points. Um, so speaking of also some of the most iconic besieges of 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 the medieval medieval past of Paris, Saint Denis, Notre Dame, and generally speaking, the, the Gothic forms, right? Uh, as we were saying before, uh, the latter were mostly the merit uh, the, of, of the work of the abbot Suger, uh, abbot of Saint-Denis from 1122 to 1151. He was a counselor of Western Frankish King Louis VI, Louis the Seventh. Um, so in a moment of great expansion of Capetian power that had now to to show internationally what he was made of ideologically and what he was aiming at uh, accordingly. So he was the one who built the facade uh, of the old Carolingian Basilica of Saint Denis. Remember, um, in uh, it was Pepin the Short, like it was had continued up to that point for four hundred years. Um, he um, rebuilt this by dividing it into three horizontal levels and three vertical sections that had to do again with the aforementioned numerological perfection of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the, uh, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and remember the entire transcendental point of the imperial action um, of the living 
of the living uh, blood all right and from 1140 1144 Suger also rebuilt the rear of the church um, providing it with this majestic and dramatic wall in uh, of stained glass windows that flooded the church with light according to his in fact um, optical um, intuitions regarding the nature of this as pure spirit as divine light uh, herself right this would be called uh, gothic um, in a bit of a contemptive way in later times this was seen as a kind of a modern um, like just the, the new the, the, the script it was still part of the Carolingian one probably they, they considered this as a sort of natural evolution of the former one gothic is just a contemptive term used by humanists to say okay this was gothic because the gods were the guys who brought down the empires and something like that right of course which is not just incorrect but also somehow ridiculous um uh, also because the gods were some of the most roman uh, uh say romanized and roman coexisting germans um ever so doesn't make much sense um Surely there was at this point a copy of the the new style, whichever uh, the name we want to use here, um, in other churches of Paris, and from there also in in the rest um, of of the world. You you can argue, right? There is all a style, an interesting study. We'll make videos about this the, the the origins of Gothic that had a lot to do with England as well. Um, as we will see, there would be English influences also in the development of the French monarch, interestingly enough. Um, but speaking of Paris, the, 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 the best examples of Gothic style inspired uh, by Suger's Su uh, work are the Priory of saint martin de champ Saint-Pierre de Montmartre, and Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Right, so this, some of these were already standing uh, etc. Uh, the style spreads pretty much all over Western Europe. It becomes uh, iconic of the the peak of the great medieval civilization that, as we've seen, France uh, embodies. Right? Um, there were mm, many other projects. This was a moment of great building. It was like an inflation even. Some of these uh, buildings, of course, notoriously were not even finished. Uh, like cathedrals at, at a point we, we completed them in the 18th, in the 19th century, right? And um, also much of what you see in terms of Gothic architecture in France has something to do with uh, Violet le Duc, with, uh, it's actually 19th century stuff, right? Literally. Um, so I will not digress on this aspect, but uh, just bear in mind that what we see, even as beautiful as it is, is it's not much because it's not how it was, it's that it just fit another world and, and also the surroundings and so on. Some, something that we cannot simply picture throughout even such beautiful um, architecture not as it stands uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, Maurice de Sully um, at some point um, even planned the, the idea for a new cathedral of Paris. Right, and this is how uh, the uh, our like today's Notre Dame de Paris uh, was born. Um, so this this took two two centuries to be completed. It was a massive working site, as you know. This was very important for the city because they just invested on a longer term, and lots of people would come to work to leave, and the city would grow larger and larger. Right, uh, the first stone of the famous square. Of the of Notre Dame was led in 1163. And this was remember on the site of Saint Stephen's, um, so that she becomes uh, as Notre Dame the the new cathedral proper, the, the cathedral see of Paris. By the way, it is not it's never an arch uh, an archdiocese, right? Because it, it, she depended on Saint. There was a quarrel with Pope Gregory the Ninth and the French monarch for, for this. Um, it's a higher matter of ecclesiastical hierarchy, uh, etc. In any case, um, the um, let's say this this you know Notre Dame stands uh, as uh, you know one of the single most iconic uh, landmarks of Western civilization, aside from the 
uh, unfortunate damage um, occurred uh, some years ago. Um, the um, the altar was consecrated in 1182. The facade was built between 1200 and 1225, and the two towers between 1225 and 1250. Here we are in the very heart of medieval, of the splendor of medieval France. It was enormous for the time. It considered 125 meters long. Um, the towers 63 in height, and enough seats just for 1300 worshippers right so the this was uh, uh, let's say such an iconic uh, structure that was even copied on a, on a smaller scale for the church of saint julien le pauvre on the uh, river gauche but you you know it's perhaps aside you know for, for medieval medieval time the most iconic um, element of the Parisian skyline. Uh, other immense structure is the Saint Chapelle, uh, which is the legacy of Louis the Ninth, right? Among the other things, known as Saint Louis because he was a saint died at the Crusade, um, and one of one of the most successful rulers uh, uh, of the time, with quite uh, significant challenges that to face but still um you know uh, incarnating the best like the the true you can argue that you know the, the true medieval millennium like just with together with the contemporary um frederick the second of Hohenstauf and uh, is there right um he uh, erected this uh building as yet another masterpiece of gothic architecture to host the relics from the crucifixion of Christ, specifically some thorns of, of the crown and uh, some wood from the cross, right, from the passion of Christ. Um, so this building had to embody the, and it really does, right, the greatest, um, say, spiritual list, um, uh, Probus of the uh, of of the French monarchy, right? The fact of having a saint within a uh, a dynasty is, is quite important. Other some of the greatest houses, like I don't know, the Habsburgs w wouldn't have one. So the French here were seen as the the paladins of uh, of the papacy of, of of Christendom. They played uh, we're saying essentially a counter imperial. Or properly an imperial on their own um, uh, role, uh, especially against the, the Ghibellines, the, the Germans, and so on in Europe. Um, and Louis was, was just a, a, a champion of, of, of chivalry, right? And chivalric behavior is quite an interesting character just to study um, himself. Uh, the Saint Chapelle was built between 1241 and 1248. Right, it has the oldest stained glass windows preserved in Paris. Right, um, and while this the, the chapelle was being built, this great stained glass rose windows, eighteen meters high, were added to the transept of Notre Dame. So still under by by Louis' will. Uh, the university we talk about the the Sorbonne. Uh, um, that emerged from even properly a, a sort of private foundation uh, under, say, Louis the Sixth, Louis the Seventh. Even if we are in relatively archaic and military times, like uh, Paris was surely one of the principal centers of learning in Europe already. Uh, people came again, as we were saying before, from England, Germany, and Italy. Uh, they held great intellectual debates. Some would became legendary in uh, just in medieval uh, philosophy too. Deep hatred and again violence, as we were recalling before, with groups of students against one another, uh, etc. So the first um, centers of learning were, as it was normal from from the early Middle Ages, the schools attached to the um, to the cathedral, right? Um, so what uh, would be Notre Dame. Uh, and the Abbey of Saint-Germain, 
de près. Uh, we remember before uh, Pierre Abelard, all right, um, and then the, his great uh, following of students that um, were were uh, meeting at the Montagne Saint Genevieve, apparently some thousands even. So just think about the the power of um, of this. Um, of this, like you say today, I have, I don't know, 5,000 followers. Well, at the time, it was pretty much the same, and people were even less, so this is generally speaking, with the means of the time, is is grandiose, right? So, uh, it was r the real hits uh, of the time. The Sorbonne was originally organized in the mid 12th century, and as the, like, all the other studio in, in Europe was essentially a guild of students and teachers who uh, was institutionalized um, through the recognition of Philip II in the year 1200. Um, f uh, the Pope Innocent III, who, uh, who had been a former student of the Sorbonne, um, we, we talked about him recently just in the video about medieval Latin. I made out a video about him, like as you know, he would embody the peak of um, ca Roman Catholic power historically. So that he uh, recognized this studium in 1215 uh, himself. Uh, so these are again the the years of all the great, um, the greatest medieval civilizational accomplishment. And Sorbonne, uh, the Sorbonne is an absolute uh, protagonist of this mechanism. It's estimated that uh, over 20,000 students lived on the Rive Gauche. So much so that what is called still today the Latin Quarter derives from that time because um, given the uh, multinational background of the uh, of the students, uh, the, the only way they had uh, at a point to, to speak with one another was Latin, at least was the most um, heard language uh, around there. Um, the poorer students lived in some um, colleges founded sp specifically for them, some uh, pious institutions that were known as Collegia Pauperum Magistrorum. Made a video that illustrates the, the costs, the unknown, the uncertainties of people living again from uh, various backgrounds in Europe, definitely from not um, really a poor background in an absolute sense. Every uh, university student was somehow affluent compared to the majority, while well, majority of the people at the time, but he could easily go bankrupt because he could live with all what his father had uh, uh, earned in a lifetime, and uh, it really cost a dramatic lot, but even if it was worth it because of what they could uh, win in other ways. Um, so naturally this um, poorer colleges were less prestigious, but they still provided you with lodging, with food, and so on. In 1257, the chaplain in Louis IX, who was Robert de Sorbonne, opened the oldest and most famous college of the university, hence uh, de Sorbonne. Uh, after him, he donated an important amount of manuscripts and all the, the stuff, and it's in his honor that the, the entire university was, uh, was called. So in, in the late Middle Ages, the University of Paris was, as we said, the most important school of Roman Catholic theology in Western Europe. Um, Roger Bacon, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, again, England, Italy, Germany. These are the countries mostly went there to get, together with the French to study, um, were provided with scholars of such caliber popes right so this this is interesting to stress like to the purpose of a universal identity you, you say paris as such is a bit the symbol of that universalism together with rome together with the in fact universal institutions and, and by whom they were represented um, as we were saying before the marchand de l'eau had always a great weight um, in paris ever since uh, the the revival of the high middle ages medieval economy kicked in 
Right. Um, Paris historically was governed by a royal provost that was essentially a, a royal functionary. Um, by uh, say the time of uh, greatest splendor of the city, living in the uh, aforementioned fortress of the Grand Châtelet, so controlling properly the access to the the most important access to the Ile de la Cité. So this had to be a very trusted uh, individual. Right, but and this guy had entered in contrast with the Marchand de l'eau because he was like public authority against the sort of mob, right? That uh, like the mercantile community basically got down to. Um, so Saint Louis was uh, sensitive to this um, to this issue, so that he established the Prévost de Marchand, so a uh, provost of, of the same. Um, merchants uh, that would essentially share authority together with the royal one, right? So recognizing the growing power and wealth of the merchants of Paris, but generally speaking, also of the bourgeoisie, um, that would make up an ever greater amount of royal officials um, in in the rightful attempt to deprive the most powerful nobility of some some power. Um, and given that the the office here uh, owned was not a matter of uh, you know private personal dynastic possession like the banner lordships or things like that, but they were just an office embodied by the state, embodied by say by the king as an extension of his power, and so in a way that you could make these these guys compete with one another for right. Um, Saint Louis created also the first communal council of Paris with 24 members, thus providing the city with, for, uh, with an institution of further representation in front of the monarchy, in front of front of the country. Right? These institutions were just emerging in the traditionally customary fashion of medieval law, but obviously, you know, the the, the council of Paris, um, the Marchand de Lobe, were a big deal uh, in throughout the realm. With the crisis of the early 14th century, the fact that this was uh, a multi-hundred of thousand um, populated inhabitants, uh, large city, and uh, you know things were not going well with such a high demic concentration, social unrest um, arose. Right, uh, there were some riots, for example, taking place in December 1306 when the um, Proval uh, of the uh, Marchand was accused of r uh, raising the rents. Uh, on that occasion, uh, the the people literally rebelled. So this um, this brought to the literal burning of some merchants. Right. Uh, as a consequence, the authorities intervened. Twenty eight uh, rioters were hanged. Right. Um, very famous rising in Paris was the one of Etienne Marcel, it was the Provost of, of Paris that led the merchants himself using a considerable amount of violence, killing um, uh, the councillors of the Dauphin before his very eyes. So a level of brutality and of sense of you know, entitlement that was a bit typical of the anti, say, at least of the um, lower level standards of the bourgeoisie compared to nobility or tradition. Um, 1357 is not a random year because just a year before uh, the King John II had been captured by the English at the Battle of Poitiers, the, um, the ransom was enormous, so there, were, there was the jacquerie actually going on in France as a consequence of a massive, extensive at least. Peasant revolts were, however, put down that violently at the same time um, and um, the the Parisian power here was trying um, unfaithfully essentially to curb the same power of the monarchy uh, in order to attain privileges for the city even at the detriment of the state right um, and uh, the general estates were participating to this as well uh, so much so that they um, this, this were some of the first years of their associations they had started for the first time in Paris in 1347. So the crown had to to play this smartly 
um, by saying, okay, well, yes, we will grant you these concessions, then the city was actually retaken by the royalists uh, in 1358. Um, Etienne Marcel was killed, and his followers, in part two, others were uh, dispersed and exiled, right? The, those who escaped, in, in part, were also captured and put to death, because this was essentially an insult to the entire monarchic institution and you see essentially the say in, in, in insight also what we complain at least I don't Ness or well you can always do it depending on the outcome uh, especially the failure of the ancien regime is uh, happening for a reason but let's say the fact that what we call narrowly ancien regime was is affirmed exactly in these years in the mid 14th century um, makes you reflect also what the alternatives really were, right? There was surely an important degree of oppression, but um, this was r done by everybody, right? You know, if if there is somebody who lets stay under, right, they will. These guys rose, but they they did so in, in con not because of any dramatic higher merit than the monarchy. So they were brought down bloodily, and that's how it served uh, as an example, by the way. Plus, consider, this, those were harsh times, right? There were the, the enemy armies ravaging uh, the countryside, the bubonic plague, um, so especially in such a concentrated center, like, was really devastating. If the Parisian population uh, was uh, 200, 300,000 at most, at this point it fell significantly, um, 150,000 perhaps in the end of the Middle Ages, this tells you the impact, right, of a city that had been, like most, and especially as, as one of, if not the very largest in Europe, um, expanded dramatically, right, just as a, we just described the massive infrastructure that we were talking just essentially about the most famous landmarks uh, built largely by the, 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 the monarchy or the church, but again, all the other, uh, like the, the the suburbs eventually encircled by the new walls, the, the various foundations, private stuff, the the think about the yards, the the docks of, of the Marchand de l'eau, the stuff. I mean, it was big, right? It was very big. Um, and the plague was really a plague, right? You know, because it came back cyclically. Um, it said that in 1348-49 it took out something like 40, 45, uh, 40, 50 uh, thousand Parisians, right? Uh, that is a quarter of the population. I say they died, we do not have very precise data here. Many people would escape if they could uh, the same city to avoid contagion. In any case, not a good um, recipe. In general, as you know, however, uh, constituted power and even the cities generally be still benefited because uh, the countryside wasn't faring better, not much because of the plague that was less f um, impactful there, but for economic reasons, the peasants, as we were observing before with the Jacquerie, etc., had the worst of it. Um, uh, in any case, the plague returned uh, in 1361, uh, 1661, six, in 63, and in 66, 68. Um, so, this would be so recurrent. Right, uh, we count 36 plagues between 3048-1480. Uh, also, in the early modern age, uh, it is said that one year out of three there would be some sort of plague. Um, the common diseases among the the urban population, as you can imagine, would be the mumps. Uh, recorded, for example, for 1414, scarlet fever in 1418, smallpox 1433 and 1438. All pretty nasty stuff that uh, just stemmed from the overcrowding, typical of the medieval cities, the you know scarce hygiene, at least for what they could achieve with the means of the time, um, general ignorance about at least the, the, the physical causes of this to a degree, um, and, uh, and just the lack of just the, 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 the modern medicines, and as you understand, um, but what was really worse, and this is quite clear from the sources, um, was war. War was much more disruptive uh, in this regard. 
uh, in 1346, uh, the English army led by Edward III um, devastated the uh, the French countryside, appearing just in front of, of the walls uh, of Paris, by the way. So devastating all the surrounding of the city, the closest um, supply sources uh, that mostly had developed around the city, like would normally be the case. Um, King John II, as we remembered, was captured at the Battle of Poitiers, um, and at that point, not just the the English, right, the the Chevauchet, etc., but some the same French soldiery and nobility, some smaller, like I made a bit about French nobility, was very stratified in many ways. There were many. They began to loot and ravage the same French countryside, including the surroundings of Paris. The Parisian loyalty was tested during the Hundred Years' War. Um, the, the Burgundians invaded Paris uh, during the night of May uh, the 28th, 29th, 1418. This was a big deal because they basically entered with uh, the English, right? And so, for a time, uh, Paris was actually in the hands of the, the, this alliance and not of, of the of the Valois, who uh, had famously moved to the Loire uh, in a moment that was really dramatic and disruptive for the French market, because it seems it was like the French market would have continued, as you know, the Hundred Years' War was a dynastic struggle on paper. But in in the measure in which the Valois, uh, the Capetian establishment, had been the one running the business, let's say, for, for so long, uh, it was still a radical change. Um, the Parisians hoped at a point to be uh, freer than before, and then this massive uh, super uh, lordship that the French monarchy had represented installed in the very heart of the city. So they said, if these kings come back to England, uh, we remain in the, the centralized position and we can play it and assume more power. Um, in 1422, uh, the north of France was ruled by John of Lancaster, the first Duke of Bedford, who was currently the regent for the infant King Henry VI um, of England. Uh, there was the only child of Henry V who had crushed the uh, French, as you know, the Battle of Azincourt, 1415. Um, and the the boy was resident in Paris. Now, the interesting thing is that um, the Duke of Bedford brought to France um, an even more refined and advanced sense of the crown, um, ritual and ideology, etc. I mean, the, the famous phrase, la, la barnière ne meurt jamais, right? So the idea that um, le roi est mort vers le roi. This is something they literally did, starting from the late Middle Ages, when did the body of the of the sovereign was was uh, descended in, in the crypt. For a moment, for a single moment, the banner of France was brought down as a sort of gesture of thank to the to the dead personally. But the point was that the office never really died ever, so that the the banner came up again and it never died and the new king was in and they used also the Kantarovitz wrote a beautiful book about this which is the king's two bodies right where literally the the one of i mean the corpse was uh you know preserved in during the, the funeral rites somewhere else but there was this huge mankan uh that looked like him um that was meant to embody the 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 divide between the the personal individual and the actual office, which is actually an anti-traditional concept because it, this makes it the 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 monarch is sort of a hypothesis of the individual probus, right, which was not meant to be before. Um, but this is how the English had developed that. The French were developed. I mean, it was a general secularistic tendency that would have made the crown, again, a, a living thing uh, detached even from the single individuals who would cover it. Naturally, there didn't have to be a gap, right? Uh, but at least in, in practice, to some degree, there was between the death of a sovereign and the effective rise of, of another. And so this English tradition was, was uh, or innovation, if you prefer, was brought um, 
in, in Paris during the, uh, the English uh, occupation. Uh, so lots of episodes at this point uh, uh, in, during this time Charles the seventh of France ruled France south of the Loire, uh, Loire River um, they tried to uh, unsuccessfully to take Paris um, on September the 8th 1429 when the same Jean d'Arc was wounded just outside the Porte Saint Honoré uh, that was the westernmost entrance of the wall of Charles V so not distant from the Louvre and in the center of power itself so uh, we will talk at some point more about Jeanne because she like her explorer definitely fascinating she she's a very uh, you know unique character in her in her kind and and you understand in her in her, her myth in her surprising capacity because it's not just that the French army of course won you know for her in a way but if it hadn't been for her impetus this is not a romantic myth right there was surely um, at this point a French awareness coalescing right uh, this had been the case for the previous centuries doesn't matter how difficult it was for controlling um, like the controlling France altogether, just the, the sense that uh, there was an hegemonic monarchy and that even, I don't know, the, the Normans, etc., didn't like the English anymore, uh, more than much, and that there was a sense that the king had always been providing for this system was was just also juridically more entitled than definitely the English one, especially after the Magna Carta and the various later constitutions, to make law. At least, where the gap of do the doctrine, let's say, of, the, of common law, uh, the, like the pay uh, the droit coutumier, like not in France really was, uh, well, he, um, is is present here. And Paris is the symbol of this. Paris is the symbol. Remember, the Saint Denis, uh, the the entire grandeur of the French monarchy depends at that point in Paris. Um, still, there is a bit of we don't have to think of Paris as a capital in a modern sense of course there was a favorite residence a favorite city a more important center but the monarchy was more important than the place remember it right and so even the single religious institutions etc were just those things not necessarily the standard pack of Frenchness um, this came all through the imperial dynasty as such right um, as we were just remembering, after the onslaught of Henry V, Paris uh, remained under the English, uh, the Burgundians, between 1420 and 1436, right? Um, Henry VI was crowned there in 1431, to show, of course, that the English were the, uh, the rightful French uh, monarchs, because that was the entire point of the war um, from their side. And when the English left um, the city, because it, the, the situation had remained untenable after the French coming back, Charles the Seventh made his triumphant return, right? Um, which uh, still happened in a in a ruined city, right? Let's consider this. I mean, the fort even of just think of what all the English could to take away the what the the damage uh, in general of the war. Uh, etc like um, the, 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 the city had been halfened uh, of perhaps as much as hundred thousands of its inhabitants since the golden age let's say so this was um, like these are the same years in which I don't know the papacy came back back to Rome I mean there is a bit the sense of restoration of the main Guelph axis on the sense that the, the French power and made videos about Louis XI, for example, had to recompose, recompact itself, had to retake what had been belonging to it, right? And there is yet another point here to make that um, even though the French recontrolled Paris, um, this was not um, the actual residence of the following monarchs until Francis I returned it to Paris. Best they didn't trust the city after what had happened. Naturally, these are generations um, 
we're talking about one century practically uh, in which uh, French uh, the French monarchic and statal power in general was able to impose itself much more strongly on whichever community um, up to that point, uh, the uh, the French royals had uh, been living in the many, let's say, in, in, in the various castles, um, cities of the Loire Valley, um, that uh, at a point had been also like the last amipos of of their family's possessions in in uh, in France. Um, so a bit of vestiges that we can date back to that point are for example the Hotel de Saint it was built at, in the late 15th century because uh, of uh, as a residence for the Archbishop of Saint that was as we've seen actually superior to the Bishop of Paris uh, and so this guy would travel with his uh, entire entourage etc and the Hotel de Cluny uh, built uh, pretty late, 1485-1510, right, uh, that was instead the former residence of the abbot of the, you know, the great Cluny monastery, right, the one of Cluniac reforms, so yet another symbol, you know, uh, French and uh, European grandeur, right, and, and the Hotel de Cluny is also, famously enough, uh, uh, the seat of the, in fact, Musée de Cluny, the Muse Musée National du Moyen Âge. So, uh, if you are interested in medieval history, that's definitely something you don't want to miss, among the other beautiful things that there are in Paris about that era, to say the least. Um, so, there are uh, some primates. Like, what was the oldest surviving house in Paris? Well, the the one from the um, French scribe and manuscript seller Nicolas Flamel, built in 1407, inserted the picture here. It's located at the 51 Rue de Montmorency. Um, it was actually not his house, right? It was a hostel that he had uh, founded for the poor. So this this is called like Pius Foundation and so on. So um, we will necessarily have to look much more in depth at the history of medieval Paris because there is really a lot of stuff and at least I talk often about medieval France but we need to 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 increase because there are definitely certain things you cannot miss in general and I'm very happy to have made this this video which is actually for the regional um, historical regional series right but I thought that Paris, uh, as for other, well, already made lots of cities, mostly city-state um, videos for that series, but Paris deserves a thing on its own, like, then the Ile-de-France altogether deserves one video, <laughs> um, perhaps, but it's also mostly Paris, but, so there is room for other stuff uh, connected with this. Uh, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time, bye.